and I'm here to talk about binding a non-signatory. I'm going to say it again, binding a non-signatory. What does that mean? Well, when you bind a non-signatory to a contract, that means that the party did not sign yet through some certain behavior or some certain term inside of the contract that under the scope of the law, meaning that there is either a statute for the description of said behavior or that there is case law in which the theories or doctrines that have already existed, a.k.a operation of law dictates that under the certain term of the contract and its description, a party who assumes a portion of that agreement assumes the agreement. So let me break that a little bit further down. If you say in a contract that some sort of subsequent behavior onto a party would be considered a full assumption of your terms and condition. And the party that you notify or send the contract to or communicate to does said action, which by law is legal, they will be bound to the contract regardless if they signed it or not. Why is this important? The reason why this is important is because I see a lot of people sending cease and desists. I see a lot of people sending um, pretty much uh, um, conditional acceptance of performance to courts, but they don't understand contract drafting 101. Now, when you draft a contract, and you create an agreement, and it is under what smooth operation of law does, which is trademark. Because as I've said in earlier videos, Title 15, United States Code, Section 1122, waives sovereign immunity. That means that the state itself can be bound under trademark infringement. You could have a traffic ticket, right? But if you have an irrevocable trust and that trust owns your name as a trademark, Michael Jordan being a prime example, then if it's eerily similar and they are getting paid, you can use the trust to go for trademark infringement. Due to the fact that trademark infringement waives sovereign immunity, you can bind the parties of the court without being considered a judicial harasser. The reason why is because there's enough Supreme Court precedents and federal statute, which means Congress consented, for you to behave in such a way. It is not illegal. It is not a crime. As a matter of fact, it is a right of action because your trust is injured. And although the trust has nothing to do with the initial traffic ticket, the mere fact that they are going to try to make a transaction under that name creates a trademark infringement, period. Now, a lot of my trademark infringements are handled through a cease and desist because that is the way pursuant to Allen v. Cooper, which was adjudicated... June 6, 2020, that is the way that I can show that the state me makes two errors that are listed under that judgment, meaning under that Supreme Court case law. The description under Allen v. Cooper is that they must show willful infringement. So when you send a cease and desist, and they fail to fucking respond accordingly to give you the adequate state remedy, which is number two, because the law states that the state can waive sovereign immunity if they don't stop. That is how you meet the two prongs under Allen v. Cooper. Now, because I send a cease and desist, I being 
Raymond De Leon. Smooth operation of law. I like my operation of law to be smooth. So what do I do? When I draft the cease and desist, I add an arbitration clause. You must add an arbitration clause for you to have a valid assumption. If you do not have an arbitration clause, the theory of assumption and all the case law that applies does not. What am I saying again? Let me, let me repeat this. For you to bind a non-signatory and waive the sovereign immunity of a state, you must have an arbitration clause in order for the assumption theory to actually take effect. You cannot just send a conditional acceptance. Like, I conditionally accept you to do this if you prove this. And then not sign. Because if they don't sign and you do not have an ADR clause, then assumption will not sticky tape their signature. The subsequent behavior to continue to do what they do in their natural course of business will not be a trademark infringement. Under a contract to arbitrate, it won't. Now, why am I introducing arbitration and assumption? Because I don't want to go to court under regular trademark infringement and have to prove all the way to the umpteenth power for seven years. It's wasteful litigation. It takes too long. When it is legally permissible to just add an ADR clause and have it rectified within four months. Your case can get an injunction. All of the state actors get paid. You are attacking the transaction behind that name. They use that name and solicit it to the public record, and they are making financial gain over it. So the mere fact that you are using operational law under their ability to eat contaminates the case because what they did was is that state actors, they took from, they literally stole from an existing entity a claim of right to the property known as intellectual property, which is your mark of trade, period. So let's read assumption, okay? I'll give you the source after I'm done reading it. 3.8, assumption. The argument to compel arbitration on the basis of assumption arises in situations where the third party has undertaken directly or indirectly the legal obligations of the contracting party in those cases. The subsequent actions of the non-signatory party in performance of the contract can lead to the conclusion that the obligation has been assumed. If they are receiving the benefit and the proceeds of your trademark and they are capitalizing on it, making capital, then they are inherently making money that you could have made by furthering your mark, which is a trespass to your preclusory right. Period. So if you tell them in that cease and desist, hey, get off my fucking trademark, Lego my ego, and they continue to, then they also will assume the obligations that you put as terms and conditions, which I am not going to get into, but I will give you a hint. It looks like a fucking licensing agreement. And here's the deal. Once they assume the continued use and they had the opportunity to get out, they continued receiving their trademarks benefits. And that equates to money on the go. It is the currency in the form of the value of that mark. So it is literally like they are taking a property, which is a Fifth Amendment violation under the takings clause, and they are monetizing it. So that continued use is an assent to the agreement because there's a waiver of sovereign immunity. They must let go. And the mere fact that you sent a cease and desist will prove willful. And because they are the state and they understand the law because they're Olympians and they run their mouths all day. They run their fucking mouths all day talking la, 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 la. Yeah, law this, law that. Then they must be experts at the fucking law. And since they didn't give you adequate state remedy as the state's representatives, then they have bound the state. Let's keep reading. Generally, courts require that a non-signatory's conduct is evidence enough of its intention to be bound by the arbitration agreement in order to arrive to the conclusion that the non-signatory assumed the obligation. What did I say? Continued use. 
when a non-signatory either assumes a contract containing an arbitration clause or receives the assignment of such a contract in case a court has to decide about the matter it is most likely i mean it most likely will compel the non-signatory party to arbitrate taking into consideration that there has to be some conduct behavior right conduct did it say signing? No. It said conduct. That means the monkey behaved a certain way and it jumped off the bed and hit its head. Evidencing an intent by the non-signatory to be bound to the assumed arbitration agreement. The principle of, sum of assumption is based on the notion of consent. Let me stop right there. Their behavior is the consent. Which can be inferred from the party's behavior. Behavior. You see that? Now I'm going to give you a bunch of fucking case law. Case law that is. Because in case law, we have the context of how the law should, I mean, how the law will be applied. Or how the theory and doctrine will be applied. How the courts will perceive the action and give you remedy. So let's do it. Let me back out of this. Bear with me, guys, because I'm, I'm, I'm cycling. Whoa, what do we got over here? Oh, come on. There we go. Now, let's open this up. When can non-signatories be compelled? Now, obviously, I'm just going to fucking sit here and tell you what this document does. This is my cheat sheet to greatness. It gives me all the case law. So if I'm putting together a complaint based on a certain behavior, I just go down this case law. So now watch this. We got the definition of assumption, and now we got the case laws of assumption. Under an assumption theory, a party may be bound by an arbitration clause if its subsequent conduct indicates that it is assuming the obligation to arbitrate despite being a non-signatory. And there you go, there's the case laws. Pause the video, and then you get to see it. I'm not gonna sit here all day. The reason why I'm not going to sit here all day is because I got more cooler shit to tell you. Be advised. Oh, Jesus. Come on. No thanks. Let's go back to the main screen. Be, adv be advised. Be advised. Be advised. Be advised. Be advised. Guys. That. You can. Literally bind a non-signatory with the elements that I gave you. So for all of you that sit there and send a conditional acceptance or some sort of like agreement to the court, what are you missing? An arbitration clause. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. A lot of times you cannot do that as a defendant. The reason why is because the court has rules, procedures, and operational law that they can impede you. Let me give you an example. I got a fucking automatic weapon. 32 kilos in the back of my truck. I pay bail. I come out. They can revoke bail at will to stop your process, and they have every right to. That's why we put it in a trust. So if any of you got any questions, concerns, go ahead and hit me up. This is not legal advice, but I put it on the table so that, as usual, when you see my videos, nobody, absolutely fucking nobody, can come to me and contest because the shit is out there. You can look it up on Google. I dare somebody to. <laughs> I fucking dare you. You send a, listen, if you send an agreement and it does not have an ADR clause and you do not have the option out, and you do not give consideration and follow contract law binding principles. You will not have a contract. IP acts as money. That is consideration. The benefit of the use. The contract needs to be written. Giving them the theory of assumption expressed in the terms. It must calculate to such. And once you have that evidence. And they continue to behave in such a way. 
that agrees with the ability to arbitrate, I didn't say litigate, arbitrate, then you will bring them into arbitration and the four corners rule will take effect, which means that it is only what is on the contract that can be looked at. And no speculation of interpretation outside of the contract unless it is illegal. And there is assumption of illegal risk can be brought into that arbitration. That means black and white within the four corners. You greatly increase your likelihood of success. And if you get an injunction against the case for the use of the name, because the parties are getting paid to make a beneficial, and, and excuse me, and they make a beneficial interest regarding that name, that trademark, then you no longer have a case. Period. The entire matter is contaminated, irrespective of anything. And then there's other things you want to put in that agreement, like non-disclosures of the proceedings before and after, so which acts as a gag order, which is allowed, but I'm not going to get into that. And there are so many things that you can do. And you can get all of the files, all of the documents that these motherfuckers used in the case because they're up for destruction and you get to get a statement of account of all movement that is attached to that name in which they benefited from. There's a recovery. And we'll talk about that another time. There's a recovery of infringement articles and the destruction of infringing articles. You can locate that in Title 15, United States Code 1122, subsection C. Be advised. Again, this is not legal advice. This is just my experiences. Consider this just like news reporting, an op-ed, an op editorial. <laughs> Think about it like that. First Amendment. All right, guys, you know what to do. Have a good afternoon.